uh, by saying good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and friends and allies. Uh, if you'd indulge me for a moment, instead of opening with one of my typical bad jokes, I'd like to start with the truth uh, and read some ins inspirational remarks given recently about the importance of allies. So I want to quote something to you. Quote, why are we allies? The answer transcends uh, narrow materialism. The animating purpose of our alliance is that we are free societies who put our faith in the rule of law. We believe that when st the strong trample the rights and independence of the weak with impunity, then our liberty and our sovereignty are at risk. We believe that when all peoples cannot sail the seas and fly the skies and engage in commerce freely, then our prosperity will suffer. We believe that when the balance of power in the world favors those bent on injustice and aggression and conquest, then the peace that we cherish will not last. That's why we're allies and why we must remain so, unquote. And those words were spoken by Senator John McCain a couple of months ago. He is arguably the American leader on security issues in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So I wanted to start tonight by reflecting on those uh, wise words by Senator McCain, while also sending our thoughts and prayers to him and to Cindy uh, and to their family as they begin his latest battle. Now, while Senator McCain made those re remarks in a different place about a different ally, I believe they speak to our alliance with Japan as well. Senator McCain is a great friend of Japan, just like Admiral Mike Mullen, who also introduced me exactly one year ago uh, during my speech in Tokyo at RJIF, the Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation's 2016 event. So thank you. Chairman CNO Admiral Mullen, for yet another overly generous introduction. If there's one thing I've always appreciated, it's creative sincerity. So thank you, sir, very much. <laughs> uh, hopefully, the media joining us tonight will take Admiral Mullen's kind words to heart as I try to be noteworthy and not newsworthy. Folks, it's great to once again be amongst so many friends from the artists formerly known as the RJIF. Congratulations to Dr. Funabashi and all members of the new Asia-Pacific Initiative, just one of many changes since last year. As strong defenders of the U.S.-Japan alliance, every person here tonight is worthy of recognition. But I'll just take a moment to specifically acknowledge a few, and to begin with Ambassador and Mrs. Sasai, thank you very much for hosting us. What you and the Japanese diplomats here do on a daily basis matters so much to our countries and to the world. To the members of Congress here tonight from both houses and from both sides of the aisle, I think we all agree that our alliance with Japan uh, is truly worthy of bipartisan support. And although he's not with us tonight, I'd like to acknowledge Bill Haggerty, our, our incoming U.S. Ambassador to Japan. I'll be seeing him in Hawaii next month on his way to Japan, and I'm going to do everything I can to support him and the American diplomacy that keeps this alliance strong. We're fortunate to have Admiral Kawano with us tonight. Uh, he and I had dinner last night, so candidly, he's probably tired of talking to me. Um, but he gave me a chance to publicly thank him for his critical leadership of our alliance and for his great friendship. Fellow flag and general officers, uh, including our outstanding U.S. Uh, Japan, U.S. Forces Japan Commander General Martinez and Generals Ariki and Iwasaki and uh, Jung and Sharp and Admirals Roughhead, Blair and Takai. Okay, rather, and to the diplomatic corps here tonight, including former secretaries, assistant secretaries, uh, Dave Shear and, and Danny Russell and Chip Gregson, and distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know the only thing that's keeping you from dinner tonight is me, so let me get down to business. As I mentioned, many of you saw me exactly one year ago in Tokyo, and while and a lot has changed in the last 12 months. So during our brief time together tonight, I'll begin by talking about how three of those changes have uh, impacted our alliance. One, last September, North Korea tested yet another nuclear device, and on July 4th of this year, Kim Jong-un successfully, successfully launched his first ever intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. Two, China increased aggressive maneuvers in the East China Sea and continued its unabated militarization of the South China Sea. And three, in May, we were all reminded that ISIS is a truly global threat, 
as violent extremist organizations banded together to occupy Marawi City in Mindanao in the Philippines. Now, while all this was going on, the U.S. peacefully transitioned power to a new administration, and one of the first leaders that President Trump spoke with was, was Prime Minister Abe. The start of what has been a reassuring and productive relationship for both of our countries. We saw Secretary of Defense Mattis visit Japan in February, and Secretary of State Tillerson visit there in March, and Vice President Pence in April, and next month our Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dunford, will visit Japan as well. Indeed, that's a lot of change in just 12 months, but I'll point out three truths that have not changed. One, the Indo-Asia Pacific remains a top priority for the United States. As Deputy Assistant Secretary Bridge Colby told all of you earlier today, the U.S. remains laser-focused on the region because our interests there are enduring. U.S. key leader engagements with the region to include Japan prove our actions back up those words. Two, America is and will remain a Pacific power and Pacific leader. And just as we have for the past 70 years, PACOM joint forces will maintain a robust and stabilizing military presence in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And three, central to this audience, the strength and necessity of the Japan-U.S. alliance has not changed. In a world crying out for leadership at the global level, the need for our alliance has never been stronger. Today, the ties that bind our countries together and have never been more robust. And I submit that those ties have never been more vital because of the mutual threats that we face. Despite or during his despotic regime, Kim Jong-un has tested more missiles than his father and grandfather combined. And he's on a record pace to conduct more tests in 2017 than in any other year. In fact, the July 4th ICBM launch by North Korea was its 10th ballistic missile test event this year. Yet another reminder that North Korea is not only the most immediate threat through our alliance, but also a clear and present danger to global peace and stability. Let me emphasize that word global. As Secretary of State Tillerson rightly said after North Korea's ICBM launch, global action is required to stop a global threat. The alarming behavior exhibited by the Kim Jong-un regime is not just a threat to our friends in South Korea, it's a threat to Japan, it's a threat to China, it's a threat to Russia, it's a threat to U.S. allies in the Philippines, Australia, and Thailand, and it's a threat to the United States, it's a threat to the entire world because North Korea's missiles point in every direction. And it's the reason that we call for all nations to implement far stronger economic sanctions against Pyongyang. Kim Jong-un is on a quest for nuclear weapons on the one hand and the means to deliver them intercontinentally on the other. Separate capabilities where he continues to make substantial progress. As the world saw on July 4th, uh, North Korea now has an intercontinental ballistic missile capability. That means North Korean missiles have the range to reach North Korea, uh, uh, have the range to reach North America and Hawaii. While I don't know if those missiles can actually hit what they're aimed at, but like horseshoes and hand grenades, getting close is all that's needed when you're dealing with nuclear weapons. Now I want you to stop for a minute and really think about this. Combining nuclear warheads with ballistic missile technology in the hands of Kim Jong-un is a recipe for disaster. And because he isn't afraid to fail in public, North Korean capability will continue to improve. So we must study and consider every possible step to increase the defense of our homelands with the best and most effective solutions possible. Additionally, Japan and South Korea and the United States are vigorously pursuing economic and diplomatic pressures aimed at persuading Pyongyang to give up its nuclear arms program. So at PACOM, we're doing our best to back up these preferred diplomatic options with credible combat power. That's why we deploy carrier strike groups with Aegis ships and the world's best submarines to Northeast Asia. That's why we maintain a formidable, a formidable continuous bomber presence in the region. And that's why we continue our ironclad defense of Japan to include de deploying our newest and best military platforms like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the P-8 Poseidon, and the MV-22 Osprey. 
And that's why I continue to emphasize multinational collaboration against a North Korean threat that endangers all of our nations. This includes incl increasing trilateral cooperation with the U.S., Japan, and South Korea, a partnership with a purpose if there ever was one. Our three countries share so much in common, democracy, free markets, a commitment to human rights, and we share common security threats. United, we're stronger, and I believe there is much that we can achieve with close co cooperation. I also firmly believe that every nation who considers itself to be a responsible contributor to international security must work diplomatically and economically to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses and not to his knees. That said, my job as a military commander is to develop hard power options for the Secretary of Defense and our President. Many people have talked about military options being unimaginable regarding North Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, I must imagine the unimaginable so that we are always ready to fight tonight. I'll echo Chairman Dunford's recent comments in saying that what is unimaginable is North Korean nuclear tip missiles delivered in Denver or in Juneau or in Honolulu or in Seoul or in Tokyo. So I'll continue to provide military options to President Trump and Secretary Mattis while doing everything possible to emphasize our desire for peaceful uh, denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. That includes calling on China to do more to exert its considerable economic influence to stop Pyongyang's unprecedented weapons testing. North Korea has only one ally, and that's China, and vice versa. That means Beijing has exponentially more influence on Pyongyang than anyone else, which makes China the key to a peaceful outcome on the Korean Peninsula. But, ladies and gentlemen, China is not the key for all outcomes. So we continue to find common ground with China about the North Korean threat, even as we criticize China's aggressive behavior elsewhere. For example, some in the press reported this week about an unsafe air intercept by Chinese fighter jets on a U.S. Navy aircraft operating in international airspace. Now, while it's always difficult to ascertain true intent of Chinese pilots, the vast majority of air and sea interactions between the People's Liberation Army and the United States continues to be safe and professional. I want to emphasize that. Most of our interactions with the Chinese military uh, continue to be uh, peaceful, uh, safe, and professional. That's because both of our nations have worked hard to develop military cooperation consultations in an attempt to avoid miscalculations. That said, I remain very concerned about Beijing's increasingly assertive actions that run counter to the international rules-based order. Some might find it odd for me to advocate cooperation with China on the one hand while criticizing Beijing on the other. But as I like to say, great powers can walk and chew gum at the same time. By that, I think we can praise Chinese efforts for help on issues like counter-piracy even as we rightly hold them accountable for not doing enough to influence their North Korean ally. I think we can and should do both. Accordingly, I'll remind you that the Chinese are building up combat power and positional advantage in an attempt to assert de facto sovereignty over disputed maritime features and spaces in the South China Sea, where they are fundamentally altering the physical and political landscape by creating and militarizing man-made bases and then using tone-deaf propaganda to justify these unprovoked aggressions as measures intended to rescue some wayward fishermen. As I've said before, fake islands should not be believed by real people. Then there's a Japan Defense Ministry report released last April that noted how Japan had to scramble aircraft more than a thousand times in the East China Sea in the previous 12 months. A thousand times, mostly because of Chinese incursions into areas rightfully administered by Japan. While these, with these examples in mind, consider that China recently had an intelligence collection ship operating near Alaska in the American Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. China was acting in accordance with international law, so no criticism there. Yet, after this week's unsafe Chinese fighter intercept, I read in the press that they complained about our U.S. aircraft operating in international airspace in the South China Sea in accordance with international law. So as Admiral Scott Swift recently opined, why does China believe that there's a different rule set 
with respect to the PLA operating in international waters and airspace, while at the same time believing this rule set doesn't apply to other nations operating in international waters and airspace. Ladies and gentlemen, China can't have it both ways. In my opinion, Beijing's desire to pick and choose when it comes to international law demonstrates the kind of nation China is. China is a strategic competitor to the United States and to Japan for that matter. That doesn't mean that conflict is inevitable. I don't believe that Japan or China or, uh, or the U.S. want that. But because we are in competition, I've advocated dealing with China realistically, as it is and not as we wish it would be. I've repeatedly emphasized that we can't allow the areas where we disagree with China to impact our ability to make progress in the areas where we do agree. All Indo-Asia Pacific nations, including the United States, should use smart power and try to cooperate with China where possible. For PACOM, my goal remains to convince China that its best future comes from a peaceful cooperation and meaningful participation in the current rules-based international order. But I've also been loud and clear that we won't allow the shared domains to be closed down unilaterally. So we'll cooperate where we can, but remain ready to confront where we must. And now to the third challenge I wanted to mention tonight, and that's ISIS, a clear threat that must be defeated. The main geographic focus of the U.S.-led counter-ISIS coalition has rightfully been in the Middle East and North Africa. But as I've been saying for more than a year now, as our military operations continue to deny ISIS territory uh, and radicalize, weaponize, and displace terrorists will inspire new fighters in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Sadly, we're seeing some of this come to fruition right now in the southern Philippines, where in 2016, uh, Isnilan Hapilan, a commander of the Abu Sayyaf group, was named the ISIS Emir for Southeast Asia. And now, in just a matter of months, Hapilan started uniting elements of several violent and extremist organizations, building a coalition under the ISIS black flag. These terrorists are using combat tactics that we've seen in the Middle East to murder in the city of Marawi in the Philippines. The first time ISIS-inspired forces have banded together to fight on this kind of scale in this region. So it's clear that foreign fighters are passing their ideology, resources, and methods to local homegrown next generation radicals. So Marawi should be a wake-up call and a rallying cry for every nation in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Only through multilateral and multinational cooperation can we eradicate ISIS and other violent extremist organizations before they spread. Now Japan has done its part as a staunch member of the coalition to defeat ISIS. It has also helped by agreeing to provide the Philippines with patrol vessels and maritime surveillance aircraft. Last year, both nations signed the landmark agreement on defense equipment and technology transfer making the Philippines just the fourth country Japan has ever inked such a pact with. And the U.S. is doing our part, not only in the global fight against ISIS, but in direct support to our brothers and sisters in the Armed Forces of the Philippines, or AFP. Yesterday, U.S. Ambassador Kim and the PACOM Deputy Commander Lieutenant General Fenton delivered two Cessna 208 aircraft to the AFP. These aircraft will significantly enhance the AFP's counterterrorism operations with the capability to locate terrorist groups operating in Mindanao uh, and in the Sulu Archipelago. The delivery of these brand new aircraft is just the latest donation from the U.S. government, which over the last five years has allocated nearly $300 million of grant funding to provide the AFP with up-to-date equipment and training. Now, while these bilateral activities are helpful, even better are multinational activities and incentives or partnerships with a purpose, as I call it. And we've seen this concept in action in the last few weeks during exercises Malabar uh, and Talisman Sabre. In Malabar, the U.S., Japan, and India continued our growing partnership to keep the peace throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific. And in Talisman Sabre, Japan and the U.S. joined our warfighting mates uh, in Australia. Unfortunately, there are some who question the motives for the increasingly cooperative relationship between U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. To this, I say our partnerships stand on their own merits. Deepening military cooperation between these four great democracies is based on shared values and shared concerns. 
So I've spoken about the clear benefits of a democracy quadrilateral that enhances security cooperation between India, Australia, Japan, and the U.S. I could use the help of all of you in this room to help make such a partnership flourish. All right, now, I know I've been up here for some time. Hopefully, I've given you each something to think about. I'll wrap this up with a challenge and a call to action before taking a few questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we're approaching an inflection point in history. We're certainly not approaching anything resembling the end of history. Freedom, justice, and the rules-based order hang in the balance. And the scale won't tip of its own accord just because we wish it would. Now, I'm a big believer that any time you can work Winston Churchill into a speech, you always sound better, <laughs> sound smarter. So let's face it, I need all the help that I can get. So I'll quote the great man himself in saying, it's not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we have to do what's required. Thus, my challenge to all of you is simple. Do what's required. For indeed, this is an inflection point in mankind's history. We must do more than simply our best. Because of the strength of the U.S.-Japan alliance, I believe that we can meet the challenge. Whether it's the U.S. and Japan working together to provide assistance during the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, or working together to create a global echo chamber to pressure North Korea to abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile programs, or working together to combat violent extremist organizations like ISIS. Our alliance is doing what's required for the security of our homelands, the security of the Indo-Asia Pacific region, and indeed the security of the world. Now that I've given you my challenge, here's my call to action. We must be reminded of the truth of the trust we share. We must be reminded of the trust we share because fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. Fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. That's a line from Transformers 2. Since it's summer movie season here in Washington, I thought that if you remember nothing else, if you remember nothing else that I said, maybe you'll remember the day that you were at the military statesman forum dinner and the PACOM commander stole a line from Optimus Prime. May God bless each of you. May God bless Japan and the United States. And may God keep our alliance as a pillar of strength for years to come. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions, and I look more forward to your dinner.